I am Jackie Fielder. I'm running for District 9 Supervisor. I'm a Libra. Yes, Leo Rising. Yes. Libra Moon. Yes. I am turning 30 in a month. Are you, what do you, how do you feel about that? I was going to say, are you scared? And that's like leading the witness. No, I'm so excited. I am yeah. ready to get out of my 20s. Okay. I feel like 30s are the new 20s. As she said, that was Jackie Fielder, candidate for District 9 Supervisor. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco, a podcast about the artists, activists, and small businesses that make our city unique. This is episode two of season seven. As I've said, I'm devoting the first month of this new season of the show to politics. Jackie first caught my eye when she ran an upstart campaign against Scott Weiner for a seat on the California Senate. It was 2020, and the world was upside down. But here was a young, smart, indigenous woman running against a borderline incumbent in Weiner. Jackie wasn't successful four years ago. But I had a feeling then that we'd be hearing from her again. Part one is all about Jackie Fielder's life leading up to her time in San Francisco. Here's Jackie. Well, I'm really, um, I really wouldn't be here without my ancestors, my grandparents especially. Um, on my mom's side, my family is from Monterrey, Mexico. And my grandparents immigrated from Monterrey. Uh, my grandfather started out as a orange grove worker, mm. so farm worker. In California? Yeah, or? in Southern California. Okay. And then my grandma was uh, just a home, a home care worker and taking care of the family and neighbor kids. Also a seasonal Seas Candy, Seas Candy factory oh, worker. Oh, there's, yeah. Yeah, like an I Love Lucy situation. Yes, yes. Can and I ask, with your grandfather, what kind of oranges? Um, what kind of oranges? I have a favorite. Do you know? Oh, I have no idea. I love Valencia oranges. Oh, really? Oh, they make the best juice. Oh, that, are they For the, my, are they the, my money. They're not the red ones. No, no, uh, I think those are blood oranges. Oh, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Um, no, but Valencia, and Valencia is a place in California. Oh, yeah. And they're grown there prominently, but like, <laughs> just, just in general. But also, Southern California. Yeah. Is yeah. like orange land. Yeah. And There's even a county called. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I grew up, you know, in my grand, most of my grandparents passed when I was younger, but I only, I got to know about them when I was older. And on my dad's side, we are Native American. My grandparents on his side grew up on Indian reservations in North and South Dakota. Okay. And uh, basically, you know, a lot of Indian families travel around the country. And so my family was anywhere between South and North Dakota, Montana, Los Angeles, and Tempe, Arizona. Phoenix, Arizona. Okay. Those so, are uh, vastly different yeah. places from each other. Yeah. So my... My dad was born in Los Angeles, raised in Phoenix, Arizona, went to Arizona State, um, became an engineer, got a job in Southern California. That's how he met my mom. They met at the club in LA. What's the club? The club was, uh, <laughs> I think it was circus, circus, circus. But oh. she, uh, my mom is uh, just retired. She's been an education secretary and her first job as a 16-year-old was at Jack in the Box, minimum wage worker. Mm -hmm. But she really wanted to be an EMT, and um, but then met my father and basically found herself in the the profession of being an education secretary. Um, okay, meaning like a secretary at a school or for a district? Or yeah, like education d district. District the level. LA County Office of Education. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's so, interesting. Um, yeah, and then and I... And when, what decade roughly did, did what, they, they meet? Did they meet? Yeah. They met? You're going to make me feel old no matter late what. Late 80s. So just, in the 80s. Yeah. Okay. okay, fair enough. Mid 80s or late 80s? And well, then... I've already done the math on when you were born. <laughs> yeah. I was already out of high school but yeah. anyway yeah. Not, not about me <laughs> I was born in 1994 Four, best yeah. year yeah they had me I was an only child okay but then um, 
Well, my dad was a, also is also a Navy vet. It's a big it's a big thing for me because um, in the wake of 9/11. He was deployed to Seattle for six months okay. away from us and to basically prepare the ships to go to the Middle East. Right. Um, and so that was a really tough time. I was six or seven years old. Right. So to be separated from my dad for that long felt like eternity. And I wonder if that's more acute as an only child. Oh, yeah. Probably. I mean, probably. Yeah, it it was it was just so it was so sad, mm. and my parents' marriage never really recovered from that separation oh, because wow. when he came back, they separated, and so I and my mom we moved out of my childhood home across the freeway, out of our community, um, into like a lower income community across the freeway, and um, my life changed dramatically. Yeah. I I still I went to schools in the in the original community that I grew up in but I couldn't you know uh, hang out with my friends after you know I, I couldn't hang out with my friends on the weekends or mm. just like hang out after five o'clock you know I had to go it home it wasn't and, the same yeah in, in the hood or, yeah yeah exactly yeah which is such a huge part of kids yeah. lives and I grew up in a big apartment complex where the neighborhood wasn't exactly safe, so I couldn't really play outside. Like, we had a pool, and that was great for summers, but mm -hmm. largely, you know, was forced to keep to ourselves. And, mm. we you know, we had neighbors that were great, and that's how we supported each other. It was yeah. a very working-class complex, and so that's really where my values come from is being raised by a single mom. Uh, my mom has always taught me to give what we can to those with less, whether that is, you know, we have access to a computer, we have a printer, and mm. so there is a family in the complex that didn't have access to that, and so of course we shared that resource. And we had, you know, a few unhoused people in our neighborhood that my mom would give a meal to and, you know, give extra blankets to, so... It's funny how these things happen. I mean, it, it's not a given, but it's kind of like that the thing of like, people in cities are generally more tolerant. Yeah. It's like when you're forced to live together and form communities, people kind of help each yeah. other tend to. Oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I grew up in, and also I spent a lot of weekends with her side of the family in South Central LA, East LA. And big Latino family, loud, you know, waving down neighbors. My godfather grew up, and my whole, really my whole family grew up in low rider culture and yes. like rolling down Whittier Boulevard. Yes. Um, my mom going out to the different clubs. And I grew up around all that big community surrounding dance and music and barbecues and just community and low riders so, yeah love it so i yeah I've, i'm i'm actually quite shy but my mom is um she's very much a people person like she has never met a stranger mm. and so being by her side growing up um i think just oriented me to be very comfortable and and understanding that kind of having an understanding of the world that it is normal for people to be concerned with their neighbors mm, and yeah. that is the mode of operation that is survival that's that's just the culture that i grew up in and to make sure everyone's taken care of yeah and then we can all have fun yeah everyone's invited to the barbecue of, but, yeah um you know again giving giving what we can to to those who need something and helping out family members like no one would ever be in the hospital alone that would never happen mm, yeah um Everyone's in each other's business for better and for worse. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> right. There's a flip side to it. Yeah. But it's yeah. that, but that's that's like the, um, an extended version of something we were just talking about, family. Yeah. It's like, we love them. Exactly. And they drive yeah. us crazy. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. But we love them. Yeah. And we'll do anything for them. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And being mm -hmm. community, you're going to... There's some people who you won't agree with, and you'll still want to make sure that they have what they need. Let's hear about when and how music came into your life. 
Yeah, um, since birth. <laughs> <laughs> Did so, they play you songs? Oh yeah, I mean, your, my yeah. dad made me a cassette tape when I was, I don't know, maybe four. And on there were Spice Girls and oh that, that old song, Que Sera Sera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what I remember. And like Men in Black, mm -hmm. the theme song. But also the fact that you're your age and you know what cassettes are oh yeah impresses me yeah <laughs> as an I know, old right? gen Xer. i feel yeah. like i just like, got the end of that and well your parents like gen, would you call their, your parents gen x i guess well my dad was born in 61 my mom in 57 so they're oh your baby mom boomers. is like yeah, yeah they're, they're both on the yeah, um okay. i guess they make some boomers but yeah um and my mom I mean, her and her whole family, my uncles, aunts, godfathers, godmothers, they love disco. Oh, yes. And so I grew up around that and Motown. And then my dad loves, oh, I don't know. He loves, I mean, he introduced me to Credence Clearwater Revival. Another Bay Area. And he had albums like, honestly, TLC. Yes. Yeah, I grew up around a lot of pop. I mean, I feel like I was very lucky to grow up in the 90s, late 90s and 2000s with that music because, I mean, I still, I love pop. I, all of that is rooted in Spice Girls, Backstreet Boys, Aaron Carter, all of that, plus disco. And I didn't really come around to my present music taste, you know, until... I don't know, the past few years, because in middle school, I was very into alternative rock. My first concert ever was Foo Fighters with my mom. Yes. She loved it. This Rip was, Taylor. I was 14. I know, so sad. So yeah, I had an affinity with them and alternative rock bands like that. And, and then in college, I don't know, I guess just like whatever you hear at frat parties. Oh. <laughs> well, I do want to talk a little bit more about growing up before college. Yeah. Can you talk talk about, so I'm going to do the math real quickly. So like it would be kind of like the early 10s when you would have graduated. So yeah, I graduated. take us from 9-11 to graduation. Oh, yeah. Well, let's see. Um, I went to public schools for that whole time. <clears throat> and... What kind of student were you? Did you like school? I was or? a very good student. Mm -hmm. I was, I don't know, not necessarily teacher's pet, but I got along with my teachers, and I always did my homework, always got A's. So that was never, it was never really a challenge for me, and my parents had high expectations. So that wasn't really my, I don't know, it wasn't a big concern for me. Yeah. I think... I think I really would have loved to have been a better uh, athlete. Mm. So I grew up playing soccer since age four or five. Ask about extracurricular. And, yeah. yeah. And as I progressed in school, you know, still doing like school soccer teams, um, because my mom couldn't afford to, to have me in a club, mm. I didn't really get the proper training to mm. be, I don't know, a stellar soccer player you just went through the school's yeah. program yeah okay and okay. like the ASO recreational leagues where you know it's like volunteer coaches or mm -hmm. very minimal uh costs mm -hmm. so um yeah I so. actually didn't know that was the thing because well I don't know a whole lot about pro soccer oh, yeah. but like I figured it was kind oh, of the, yeah. the pipeline. That it's such a big deal too in Southern California, and I feel like the culture is so surrounded by fame and success that it seeps into athletics too. Where, okay, whatever, you got good grades, but do you play a sport? Are you like really good? Right. And our our high school, I think, has sent more people to the MLB than like Ivy Leagues. Oh wow! So my high school was ba almost 4,000 kids. Wow. Total. My graduating class was 970 students. Oh my God. And so they were, they were, they're just churning us out in Southern California. Yeah. A uh, public school system to, you know, be workers and worker bees, not right. necessarily, you know, 
the future leaders. I feel very lucky because I had amazing students, uh, amazing teachers in my certain track. I wasn't necessarily in the honors track, but mm -hmm. I, I took, you know, the AP classes and whatever. Right. But, yeah, I mean, growing up, I've always been kind of introverted, but with a really solid friend group. Mm -hmm. And I feel very lucky for that. And that different friend groups throughout high school, I was just, I don't know, I was in sports, I mean, soccer, I was in community service groups. I. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Where, where did that, was that your choice? Because I feel like that ties into who you are now. Yeah, I in a think good it, way. Yeah, I mean, I was in various different community service clubs, and I in high school took on a. Basically, I wanted to see a lot more gardens in elementary schools and just in general because I remember uh, before before I went to public schools, went to a private school that had a garden right. and again going back to growing up in a like kind of cramped apartment complex very little access to green space it just like i i have so few experiences actually planting a seed and like working the soil with my hands especially right. in southern california where your access to nature is i don't know three hours away we, i never went camping until yeah. college right right so seeing green it's not northern california yeah exactly it's not the same big reason why i'm here yeah but the access to nature is very limited so yeah. gardening was a big undertaking at least I uh, had a lot of friends help to establish some uh, community garden in uh, elementary school. Awesome. At your yeah. elementary school? Or no, a, at another uh, school? a public elementary school in Long Beach. That's great. Yeah. And then what else did I do? I don't know. It's a very, uh, in my high school, it's very kind of town oriented. So I don't know. We didn't get up to too much trouble. I was, again, very like by the rules at home at the time I needed to be home on my homework doing the sports after school and had a great solid fun group we would go to I don't know like the beach uh, in my senior year we surfed a lot oh. um, yeah I grew up surfing I feel very lucky for that my dad got me some surf lessons when I was in middle school and I carried that into into now I don't surf as much as I would want to I rarely Here. surf. Yeah, these days. Well, do you surf in a wetsuit down there, or? Um, I think yeah, I would surf in a wetsuit down there. Okay. So like here, it's it's a little it's different. Yeah, my favorite places to surf: Bolinas and Santa Cruz. Oh. Pacifica, I think, is a little bit packed these days. Well, and it's gnarly there, right? Yeah. I mean, Ocean Beach is gnarly. I I can't justify yeah. that. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So you said you weren't getting in trouble. Were you ever, I'm just curious, because the picture that you're painting for me is that you were kind of like a good, you're a good kid. Yeah. Did you ever have a bad streak or anything you needed to get out of your system? I really can't think about it. I, I can't think of any instance in which I rebelled, really. Yeah. So. I think maybe running for office is your oh, rebellion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have... <laughs> Definitely. We'll get into that. Made up for all of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's. Um, I think you've done a really good job of taking us through probably your high school yeah. years. Was it a foregone conclusion that you? Because you mentioned college. Yeah. Was it a foregone conclusion that you would go? Oh, I yeah, I knew I would go. I did not know where. I had a lot of imposter syndrome around applying to Stanford in particular because it was so prestigious. I had barely found out where it was the year before. <laughs> and I, I've lived here 25 years. I'm still not sure. <laughs> yeah. It's like in a forest. Yeah, exactly. Way, somewhere. It's just like <laughs> I, I had no idea what it was. Yeah. It wasn't even really in my realm of possibilities. I thought I would go to a UC school. And, you know, I actually really want to go to Berkeley. That was, that was my goal. But... Okay. Uh, they didn't want me, and oh. it's okay, because <laughs> my sister just got in. Okay. She's uh, 17 years old, but um, Congra I congrats. Thank Jackie's you. Sister. Yeah, but this is the power of friends and community, 
I was downing myself to apply to Stanford, so much so that I was actually going to just not do it at all. And then one of my friends called me two days before the deadline and said, hey, are you applying? I said, no, I don't think so. UC app was really hard. I don't think I got it. It's just, you know, I'm just not going to get it, so why apply? And they are like, no, you need to apply. This is my friend Chris. You need to apply. The worst they can say is no. And so I was like, shoot. And you don't get in if you don't apply. Yeah. And yeah. so I was like, man, okay. Well, I cranked it out. I responded to all the essays. I was just like, let me just be my most authentic self. And I'm not going to try to paint a picture for them of this perfect student because that's just not me. I will get in on my own terms and just being myself. And then uh, I thought I was going to go to USC because I got accepted. And I Much even, closer to home. Yeah, I was. And you knew where it was. Yeah. And I was bickering <laughs> with my mom about paying for my housing application fee. Uh, I was like, just pay it. I'm not going to get into Stanford. Like, just pay the fee oh, wow. so I can get the, the jump on housing. And she was like, Jackie, no, just wait. And then I got an email on a, like a random, I don't know weekday and Tuesday and I um, when I saw the note congratulations I just I lost it I like nothing made sense it was as if the world was gonna crack open beneath my feet and I was gonna fall into it yeah it was just like I got so dizzy and shocked. I was like hyperventilating. I never react that way. And this is like spring semester of your senior yeah. year yeah. kind of thing? Okay. The very final So you were 17. Yes, yeah, so I was 17. So this is 23rd? Yeah. No, 2011. Yeah, this is 2012. 2012, okay. And yeah, right. and so, and then uh, I got in, you know, <laughs> There's a lot so, of so you figured out where Stanford is eventually. I did figure it out. <laughs> got in. Good. I thought I was going to do pre-med. I didn't. Oh. I actually uh, made a switch from pre-med. I thought I was going to do biomechanical engineering. But I just did not have it in me. I really just wanted to help people. That was the crux of it. Well, isn't that what biomed and all... Yeah, totally. Medical is like, but, but you figure different ways. In different ways. And I had kind of an epiphany about it at this very rare conference around public policy. Okay. Because I was pretty interested in education in general. And I just had a lot of questions about why did I get in out of 900-something mm. students mm. and... I, f I fit like a certain demographic, but so do all these other students. Like, why is it, why, basically, why are the outcomes the way that they are? Right. And that really started my kind of awareness of race and class. Okay. And all the things that go into, you know, a student's outcomes, a student's ability to succeed. And this happened after you were already at Stanford? Yeah. Or, okay. When I was surrounded by, you know, people that were legacy admissions, and right. I just felt way out of my league. Right. And so I was pretty overwhelmed, lots of imposter syndrome, but, um, but found, you know, great friends and that I still have today. But I think something, and, and I'm just, I don't care if you agree with me, <laughs> but something that I think about you is that... You're wicked smart. You have a capacity. You. you have a capacity to know things and know systems. And I think probably what motivates that knowledge acquisition is a curiosity. Oh yeah. So I think from probably from that young age, you were like, "This is all weird." Oh yeah. What's going on here? Oh totally. I think I've always had a. I mean. I think it kind of goes back to 9-11 and um, also watching a lot of Travel Channel. I know that's really random, but just kind of being teleported to different cultures, uh, societies, and trying to wrap my head around what is happening in the world. Mm -hmm. Why is it the way that it is? Mm -hmm. Why is there so much suffering? Um, you know, like the, the Save the Children commercials would always get me as a kid, and yep. I would just feel, like, so heartbroken. I 
love animals so much, and that was also a big thing. Yeah. So Sarah, I think Sarah, I've is always it Sarah, Mc, Sarah uh, McLaughlin. Yeah. Who does the, yeah. 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 Those <laughs> in the arms. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But also, I can't. Yeah. I can't exactly. Do it. Yeah. I feel, and then you know, again. My dad, being in the military, was also deployed a, a second time when I was 16 for a year. And I know I, I had better ways of dealing because I was 16, I had my own life, I had my friends, and I had like a sense of freedom. But I know that that was hard on my sister and my stepmom, who my sister at the time was four or five. Um, and I remember the day before he was deploying, um, we had like a little kind of send off party and we were seeing karaoke mm. and kind of, you know, like cinematically there was the Imagine song by John Lennon and I just like broke down in a way that I don't break down in front of my family It's an about. interesting send off to war. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and it's just, it was, uh, it was just in that moment, I, it's just like, it, none of it made sense. I was like, why does he have to go again? And this is not, it doesn't make any sense. And there are thousands, millions of military families that have to be split in this way. Yep. For what? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I would dig into that more later. Yeah, you'd, you'd be able to better answer that later. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. So take us through Stanford. Um, Did you? It was the best of times. It was the worst, worst of times. <laughs> Did you do how many years? Uh, four. You graduated in four? Yeah. Or, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Stanford is a very much its own bubble. So 98% of students live on campus. Um, I was involved in sorority life for a time, but then was kind of like disillusioned with it all. Again, coming back to the class consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um that said, I still have friends from that life. Yeah. Um, really great friends. And I also re felt very lucky to have great freshman dorm friends. Um, but I, I don't know. I really struggle with the imposter syndrome. There, I don't know. There's, there's always been a kind of struggle among low-income students, first-generation students to find... Um, I guess just kind of a sense of home there. At Stanford. And okay. while my dad went to college, I do feel like I had a lot of the first gen experience because my mom didn't go and that's predominantly who raised me mm -hmm. growing up. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just a very weird world in which you're also rubbing shoulders with like billionaire families, mm -hmm. billionaire students mm -hmm. who they'll never, they'll never have to worry. like. Their career is their hobby. It's not yeah. like a way of survival. They might as well be wearing skates. <laughs> it's like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I've ever been in that situation, yeah. but yeah. Uh, <laughs> but then I can um, judge from the outside. Yeah. But you know, for me, it was also like, uh, all right, well, I'm abandoning the path that is um, secure and lucrative because I'm not going to be a doctor, and maybe I'll be a lawyer. Not really sure, but really want to do um, public service okay. and so that's I mean realizing that I wanted to study education policy understand why again like why was I one out of 900 something students right. to end up here why aren't there more of me that that pushed me to decide to major in public policy which was mainly economics hmm. because I knew that people in positions of power often justify their decisions with economics so I wanted to understand how they're making these decisions and you know Sanford economics is under the the shadow of the Hoover Institution which is one of the most conservative, conservative think yes, tanks in the country yes um, you know Condoleezza Rice is in the poli sci yeah. department yeah. and you basically have people justifying, you know, eroding work protections. Uh, I remember specifically this exercise in one of my economic analysis class about cost-benefit analyses, and it was it was something like a, a development project that had 
to me, had clear environmental impacts, mm -hmm. but none of that was considered no. in the cost. It gets in the way. You know, it's just it's like, Maggie, oh, yeah. you know, it's an externality, and the role of government is to make sure that the externality is properly allocated. It's challenging to get through because I knew what it was justifying, but I still wanted to understand and have have a... Yeah, just have the, the vocabulary, the framework to understand how those decisions are justified. Was there room at Stanford, I guess, specifically in, in economic theory or, or whatever, what have you, was there room for alternative? Not really. Yeah. Not at Stanford. <laughs> yeah. So did you, assuming you discovered other ways, was that all after? Yeah, way after. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I also wanted to balance that out. I said... Oh my gosh, I need something else. So I wanted to get a master's in sociology. And so basically I crammed in my credits and classes. I went abroad to Turkey to oh, wow. during a summer to get my credits. Um, had an amazing time in Istanbul mm. and Turkish people are lovely, so hospitable. Um, had a great time. I learned a lot of history about the Middle East. Uh, a lot of history about Turkey, and there's interesting parallels between the like nationalist story that they tell themselves and the um, blatant ethnic cleansing and kind of assimilation project of the Kurdish people too that I found pretty similar to the experience of Lakota and Hidatsa people um, that I had, had, had just learned about at that time through American Indian Studies. Right. So it was very Half fascinating. Half a world to me. away. Yeah. Yeah. Patterns. Yeah. And so I crammed in a master's in sociology. Okay. In my fourth year. Oh, wait. You did a bachelor's and a master's yeah. at the same time? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Like, okay, for listeners, you are a real person. Yeah. <laughs> That's just unreal. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's kind of nuts. I was thinking maybe this is a good time to bring this up. Uh, so gr having grown up in Southern California and then come up to Palo Alto is the peninsula. It is Northern California. When did you come to San Francisco for the first time? Mm -hmm. And these could be the same, but like, when did you figure out, oh shit, that's where I want to be? Yeah. Well, the first time was... Uh, the first week of freshman year. Cause our the first time ever to come to San yeah. Francisco. Okay. Because our freshman dorms would go out into the city and have like a scavenger hunt. So oh, we fun. Were I, actually, I actually like those. Yeah. <laughs> if done right, yeah. they can be fun. We were up in Ghirardelli Square. Yes. And I honestly don't remember the rest of it. but all That's all good. I just remember being in Del Ghirardelli Square and yeah. like Fisherman's Wharf. Mm -hmm. um, and... It was really, I guess it was after college that I, I didn't really have a plan. I was very kind of, for a long time, I will say, probably up until the time I decided to run for state senate, it's been very uh, living in the moment. Seat of the pants. Trying to, city, yeah. yeah. And kind of just waiting for my intuition to guide me somewhere permanent. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that per se. Like, no, and yeah. I'm glad I did. I mean, I after college, I was just kind of, I don't know, bumbling around. I worked an office job downtown at the Embarcadero at a foundation. They're, they do great work on criminal justice, immigration reform. Uh, economic and youth empowerment. So I got to see a little bit of that world. And, and that tracks with your education, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. And I actually, that's how I got to meet, well, both Latifa Simon, and, whose campaign Who I volunteered just on. just spoke in the DNC. Yeah. That blew me away. So cool. It's honestly so cool. her time. That's yeah. been, it's been long overdue. Yeah. Her time. Yeah. She, so I actually was at a, uh, event for another SF politician, but I saw Latifa Simon speak, and I was like, I want to help her get into BART board. I'm, you know. Can I ask, was this a Jane Kim event? Because um, that's where I met Latifa. No, this was Matt Haney's event. Got it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. But um, so you I went was, to work with or yeah, for? Yeah, I, w- I was a policy fellow, volunteer, okay. intern on her campaign after college. Okay. Um, and this is like mid 2010s. This is 2016. 2016. So I was just super stoked to be around her. She is such a force. Mm-hmm. The way that she's an amazing orator and she has an amazing story. She is a single mom, mm-hmm. legally blind, um, ran for BART board, and is just an amazing woman. So she was, you know, a big role model for me. And she tasked me with uh, reviewing what changes BART police had made to their policies since Oscar Grant had been shot. Mm -hmm. And I had, um, you know, I had like a a real awakening around racial justice in 2014 on campus at Stanford during the Black Lives Matter movement, then around Mike Brown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So Ferguson. Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a big deal. That was like when Black Lives Matter was... Born effectively. Yeah, well, there's Trayvon Martin first, but then mm. this was kind of like the, the, I don't know, to me it was the big climax mm-hmm. and point for people my age to jump in. So, mm. yeah, campus protests, um, being involved with the student groups of color, trying to fight for, you know, existence on campus, and um, all of that really. It really uh, shook me and had me interrogate, you know, what is my role as a non-black person in this world with this privilege of a Stanford degree? That was District 9 Supervisor Candidate Jackie Fielder. Next week on the podcast, Jackie talks about her life and electoral politics. Part 2 drops next Tuesday, wherever you get podcasts. Music for Storied San Francisco was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Our contributing producer is Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our seventh season, we have more than 220 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If possible, please, please, please rate and review the show. I want to know what you think. Follow us on Instagram and threads at storiedsf and reach out to us there or email us at storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Be extra careful crossing the street and keep being wacky, creative, and kind out there. See you next time on Storied San Francisco. We acknowledge and respect the first humans of the unceded land we call San Francisco, the Ramaito Shaloni. We condemn the genocide of these and other tribes across the Western Hemisphere. We honor their legacy and history, and we support rematriation and sovereignty efforts. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.fm, best frequencies forever.